Hi, everybody, and welcome to this week's episode of Home to Hear. As you know, at Home to Hear, we talk to adult immigrants about their journey from home to here. So from their home country to wherever they are in the world today. And I'm so, so, so excited to introduce today's guest. A hi. Hi, a hi. Hi, Tiani. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> Thank you for being here. So tell us, where are you talking to us from today? I am in Paris. Oh, so this wow. is where I live now. Yeah. And do you want to um, tell us a little bit more about yourself? Yeah, sure. So I'm from Nigeria originally, and um, I grew up in Nigeria. I was born and raised there. And then I moved to England when I was 16 for school. And I just moved to Paris a year ago. So Oh, wow. So this is not your first rodeo as an immigrant. <laughs> No, this is my second. And yeah, I mean, outside of that, professionally, um, I'm an accountant, but on the side, I, I write. Um, I'm a writer. So, yeah. So what was it like growing up in Nigeria? What was your childhood like? Tell us about that. So I really enjoyed being a child in Lagos. Um, I grew up having five brothers and I was such a tomboy. So my memories include um, being the goalkeeper, playing football with my brothers, swimming, being bitten by soldier ants when my brother and I fell into the bush. Um, they include playing, yeah, a lot of sports, even in school. I used to run track. And on the way home from school, when we were stuck in traffic, buying yogurts or stopping to buy ice cream or yeah so it involves a lot of food uh involves a lot of memories with family it also involves reading um which i did a lot i read a lot of enid blyton growing up as same well. girl i'm an enid blyton girly <laughs> all the enid blyton girlies <laughs> we must yeah exactly <laughs> we must start a support group where are we today <laughs> 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 exactly um and Roald Dahl yeah yes and, I literally yeah. actually just got a going solo again I don't know why I bought it again oh uh, but I'm going to read it again just to see you know because some things when you're looking at it through the mind of a child's eye you're like that was really good yeah. I'm like no okay like as a 30 something old woman like Roald Dahl what were you actually about <laughs> <laughs> exactly so I still have a lot of his books in, in on my shelf in Lagos and yeah, so those are my memories. And uh, when you were leaving home to go and study for, go and go for high school in the UK, do you remember what that was like? What was, you know, the conversations like? What did that feel like? What did that move feel like? Um, so, I mean, growing up, first of all, secondary school, primary school, secondary school in Lagos was really great. I felt like I had a great education, but um there became sort of a move towards people sending their children abroad if they could afford to do so for university, because there were a lot of Nigerian universities that would have, especially the public universities that would have um, strike action and, and complaints, and then people would end up spending more years in university than they were planning to. So I always knew that thanks to my, my parents, I would be able to go abroad. Um, my older brothers had gone to America though, so um, I was, I then decided to go to England as opposed to America. And I then convinced my parents of that because I was like, first of all, I think a lot of my friends were going in that direction. Then it's closer to home. And being in England, there was a, two, there was basically like this two year buffer before going into university that I felt like I needed that transition. And I felt like I wasn't ready so all of those things basically informed my choice to go to England as opposed to America. And when you uh, arrived in the UK, what was that like? Who, did you, did your parents go with you? Did you kind of just like get to Heathrow solo? And what was that experience like? And I mean, had, I'm not sure, had you visited the UK before? Yes. Yeah, so um, thankfully, I would go on summer holidays every couple of years to the UK and to America. And um, when I was moving at the age of 16, two of my brothers were with me. So my younger brother and one of my older brothers. 
And I remember the day I got to boarding school and they were both there and, and my parents as well. But it was the first day of orientation. It was the first day and it was orientation. And um, all the girls were out in the the garden of the boarding house and everyone was talking. And I remember being really shy and standing in the corner. And then my brothers just pushed me forward to to start interacting with the other girls. So that's kind of like the memory that I I hold on to, um, that I, I could just never forget. I was just so shy. And then they just were like, okay, enough is enough. You have to actually go and talk to other people, not just us. So um, it was quite scary. And I remember the first day having my parents leave me there and my brothers leave me there and just knowing that I was going to be, because I'd never been in boarding school before I grew up just like living at home with my family. So moving to a new country, but then also being in a, an environment where I was just like stuck there with these new people was quite um, scary. But then thankfully it was a very international school and most people in my boarding house were going through the same thing. Actually, pretty much everyone. So I, I made like very fast friends. Um, so that was, yeah, it was it was hard for the first few hours, but then after that, it was a really like quick bonding experience amongst the girls. So, And in Loved that it. time, like being in boarding school, I'm a girl who was also into boarding school. Uh, I started, I went when I was, yeah, 13 and that was, and I stayed there, well, I guess until I finished school and going to school in Zimbabwe, similar to the UK, we also have like the A-level system. So did my A-levels and oh, yeah. the whole thing. Um, but yes, boarding school can be quite an interesting experience, but it's also very like um, character building. So what are some character building moments that you experienced in boarding school? Just being international versus being um, British and just knowing the difference between that. So when we came in to, with our boarding house and stuff, we didn't realize that the Girls, girls International House, our boarding house had a reputation of being like, you know, um, really geeky, just, you know, international kids who are very serious. And then the day kids kind of put us in a different box and treated us kind of in a different way. And then they would, there was like a long running joke that they had over the two year period about just girls and the girls being like super nerdy and stuff. So just generally dealing with that kind of, of humor, first of all, um, made me a bit more thick skinned. And other than that, I think it was just, you know, dealing with things like having a, like infatuation and, and having maybe people knew that you kind of had a crush on someone and then they were like making jokes in class and stuff like that. So I definitely dealt with all of those things, which I wasn't familiar with before because I went to a girl's school in Lagos. So that was another transition for me because then I was in a co-ed school. So, yeah, I think those those were some of the <laughs> some, some of the key things um, that I, I faced and then you stayed on in the, which part of the UK were you in for boarding school? Um, so boarding school, I was in Seven Oaks in Kent. And then I was there for two years. But then after that, I moved to London for my university and for master's and to work. So I basically lived in London after that for like another 13 years. And now let's kind yeah. of move into like the London years. I know. What was um, that experience like? I mean, first of all, coming from Nigeria, which is a primarily black country, and now exactly. living in the UK, which is, you know, it's a mixed, mixed part. I, I always feel like London is so much more international and cosmopolitan than I'd even like dare to say New York in some respects. But yeah, so what was that? What was that experience like? Um, no, you make a very good point because first of all, growing up in Nigeria, I didn't have to think about race as an adjective to define myself. And I only had to think about that when I first went to boarding school. And London for me was actually my first taste of independence because when I was in boarding school, it was still like, as you said, a very controlled environment. Um, we could hardly leave for the weekends, everything you had they had to have like really strict permissions and stuff like that. But then when I moved to London, it was like 
complete freedom. It was also a very international university that I went to. So that that was good. So in that way, it was a continuation of things I liked. But then it was my first taste of being um, alone properly in, in, in a new country and also just understanding what it meant for me to be I guess black, Nigerian, um, international in this in in the university. Um, unfortunately, as I said, I went to a you know I went to LSE and it was like a university where people are very socially conscious and quite international. So the group of friends that I first encountered were like all quite international, quite open, um, and it definitely made it a really great experience um, in my in my first year. And I feel like, as you say, London is such a great place to be, I guess, exposed to because it's just so diverse. Um, Even when it comes to food, like there's Nigerian food, there's Caribbean food. Indian food. food. Oh, my gosh. The best Indian food I've had outside of Johannesburg is in London. (laughs) Exactly. So it definitely like made it easy, I feel, or easier. People are are, um, quite exposed culturally um, in London. So that was a really like good experience in university. And just also being in a university where I wasn't having, I wasn't in a campus. So I was really exposed to London life because we were living in London and then we would um, finish our classes and then immediately sort of like be out and about in London. So it just felt like the city was just available for us to roam through. <laughs> so, mm. And yeah. in that time of, you know, roaming, like you said, you had a couple of, you had a, a number of international friends and, uh, you know, people that are, you know, socially conscious and so forth. And you're also a young person that's developing and growing and figuring out what matters to you in, in this life, you know, how did you determine what your values are when you were in that season? Okay. So that's such a good question. I feel like, first of all, being that I was raised Christian, I was also raised by, I think my parents are a bit more on the traditional side or have my family has more traditional values and being the only girl. um, So I kind of feel like I've always had pressure I put on myself in terms of expectations or maybe expectations as well from other people. But I always felt like I had to be, I had to carry myself in a certain way, not only doing well academically, but also um, just being a good girl. And that whole, that good girl thing was, first of all, it was a stereotype that um, they had about international girls at my boarding school. But it was actually true for myself and most of my friends. And I feel like that I I had to carry that definition with me, even to university, um, because it was, I just kept thinking about, you know, when you leave home and then there's this thing that sometimes people say, which is like, don't forget where you came from. Yeah. So that, I felt like I had a lot of pressure on me or expectations to, continue to be a good girl. So for me, that meant, I mean, not just in terms of religious values, but just not like just how I carried myself, not, not being too messy. Like, you know, when we would go out or we would go clubbing, I'm like being a young adult, especially in London, I kind of felt like I held myself, I held back a little bit. So yeah, I kind of felt like I being from having that in my mind in terms of um, the the values that I carried and um, that my family reminded me of meant that my experience in, in London, especially as a young adult, when I first moved, I think was a bit not, I don't want to use the word repressed, not repressed, but I was definitely quite careful in terms of how I carried myself and what I allowed myself to do. And I feel like at every moment there was a voice in my head, you know, in terms of like giving myself boundaries. And I don't think I've necessarily dropped that voice. And I I don't know what it is, but I think it's, it is the combination of 
yeah, being coming being an only girl from a more sort of like traditional family and you know with the religious values and stuff i think that mix has i it means that i don't give myself all the liberties maybe that some other young adults <laughs> had given yeah. themselves um, so and just picking up on that thanks for sharing that yeah so my question to you now is um maintaining that good girl image or quality do you think it's something that's helped you or it's something that has hurt you or both and like what does it look like kind of looking at both sides that's actually a really good question so i think i think in some ways when i reflect back i don't i feel like it could have hurt me because for example i think um my good girl behavior stalled my dating experiences um and so for example my first proper relationship was when i was at university and then i ended up dating the same um person for quite a long time so like five five or six years and i feel like that was probably that would have been different if i were if i opened myself up to I guess more experiences at a younger age and it wouldn't have necessarily even stopped me from being a good girl but just kind of seeing what was out there and exploring but I kind of felt like I had to you know commit and be focused and be loyal and all of those adjectives meanwhile even to be honest like I remember my dad telling me when I was younger like oh you should just have a look have a look around so it was <laughs> So actually it would have been fine. I would have been given, you know, permission to do that, but I just I just kind of was one of those people that was like, okay, no, I have to just, you know, be very committed and and be very serious and just follow like one specific path. And I think as a result of that, I wasn't super exposed um to the different potential or different options in in the dating realm and so i ended up i think um i spent a lot of time on 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 that one relationship which i don't necessarily regret but it just meant that when i left it i left it to move on to things that i should have known already that i i needed so yeah so I, I definitely feel like it it would have helped me in that situation if I were less of a good girl. <laughs> we'll come back to the dating uh, portion yeah. of things <laughs> as we, you know, look then like as to like, you know, where you are right now. But then so yeah. you started your career in London. Uh, what was that like? What was getting your first work experience in, in London? What, what was what's corporate London like? <laughs> um, so. My very, very first work experience was actually in Lagos. So I did a couple of internships in Lagos. I did an internship, two internships at, at a law firm in Lagos, and I did another in like just um, management consulting. So for me, Lagos was interesting because I remember I had to wear heels, for example. Like that was basically compulsory. Had you have to? to you know, look, yeah. <laughs> Because I remember when I was interning at this law firm and then they were like, no, you have to look a certain way. Like you have to carry yourself in a certain way. So you should wear heels. Or there was one time on my, my first day at the consulting firm, I came in with um, a sleeveless top and it was professional with trousers and stuff. But they're like, oh, you have to go back because you can't be showing your your arms in, in a professional environment. So that was kind of my initial experience of of um the work scene and then moving to my my first experience of working in in london which was my experience for the next five years because um it was basically my job after my masters and then i i stayed there for five years it was just quite different it was very relaxed in comparison and then getting used to being completely 
like calling people by their first names, like even if they're partners, which is so different for me because growing up in 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 Lagos, um, everyone was auntie and uncle, even though they were not related to me. Yeah. So I had to kind of become okay with call, saying calling people by their first names or having um, casual conversations with really senior people with really impressive backgrounds. Whereas in Lagos in the past, I used to be you know, more quiet, like my, let's say my parents are having conversations with those types of people. And then I'm only supposed to be in listening mode and I'm not supposed to be speaking as much. So I kind of feel like I had to then get used to, I had to basically get used to that. And that was, that was quite different for me um, because it, it, it didn't match my cultural background, but it was very important in terms of building contacts, making connections, networking, to be more open, to be less quiet, to put yourself out there more. Um, so I definitely found that to be sort of a transition from what I was what I was used to. A lot of people have spoken about that on, the, on when they come on. And that's more like in a lot of the guests I've had, you're our first guest in Europe. Yay! Yay. So a lot of the guests that I've had are living in America now, uh, immigrates to America. And they talk about, you know, a lot of us grew up in, you know, British culture. So Americans are very, I don't want to say forward, but they are forthcoming <laughs> about themselves, what the type of work that they do. They run their own media outlet. You know, they are the CEO of, yeah. their, of their PR. <laughs> and that's not traditionally, you know, how as Africans we do it. And then uh, and we always like, you know, link it back being like, oh, but it's because, you know, as a British colony, this is the, you know, British culture where you don't, everything is very subtle mm -hmm. and everything is suggested and nothing is like implicitly uh, relayed by you about you. So it's interesting to speak to someone who learned like that, that, that to make that transition to like step into that, I guess, you know, ability to converse, uh, build up your confidence in the UK, which is something that everyone else traditionally says, because of being a British colony, we actually don't have this type of skill. How does that like land to you? No, that's, actually, that's interesting. And I think maybe there is the transition from, I guess, growing up in, in Nigeria, and moving to the UK. And then there's another, the transition of um, the, even the UK to America. And I think America, as you said, is like on another end of the spectrum. So <laughs> I think maybe the UK is somewhere in the middle, but for me, it was still a transition because except for just, and I think maybe there are other people who grew up differently. There are other people who are probably more outspoken, but I was always more quiet. I'm also generally a bit more introverted, a bit more shy. And in in the spaces that I grew up in, I was always a bit more sort of like subdued, like when it myself, like when it came to, let's say, being around adults, um, though I wouldn't feel comfortable speaking to them in a certain way. And there was actually a book that I read called um, Quiet by Susan Cain, which was really good because it spoke about well, especially, I guess, speaking about Americans and how it's so different from people from other cultural backgrounds who are raised in different ways or have um, those types of influences um, to then sort of have to come and, and cope with that, with a different professional culture where everyone is more outspoken and it's important to, to sell yourself. Mm -hmm. Because even when it comes to modesty, about your achievements or humility, that's also something that I perceived differently. So I would never be, I would never say, oh, look, I did this or this is what I achieved. But actually now understanding that that's really important in the work environment. Whereas at, at home in Nigeria, I would have thought that that was kind of a bit more like bragging. So it's, it's those in differences that I'm learning about. For my first five years, as I said, I was working in, um, I was basically an auditor and, and a consultant in, in a firm in London. And then right before the pandemic, I, I had already decided that I wanted to work in international development. So I moved to another organization and I was basically there for 
most of COVID, a job that I had started a few weeks before, but then I was working remotely. And so I did that for a year and a half. And then my current job, um, which is how we met, which I started now, I think about two and a half years ago. Um, I remember being in Lagos actually around the time of of COVID um, because I I had gone home for a prolonged period because I was living alone in London and I could work remotely. And I remember I was looking for another opportunity and I just saw this one and I just immediately felt like it was for me. But the funny thing is I had never thought about moving somewhere else. Um, And it was only when I saw the job description that I realized it was either Paris or DC. And for me, I, I immediately decided to move to Paris. But for me, Paris just was, I didn't even think about it. And I think there are different reasons for that. First of all, I was already in Europe. But then aside from that, I had always had an interest in French. And and that was not only because I knew that I wanted to work in international development and French is important for international development, but also because of the history that my mom had with, Fran- with, with French and with Paris, because she actually studied in Paris for her university. So I think that a part of me really wanted to have that experience in parallel with her. Mm. And I had always wanted to speak French as well, um, fluently. And so when this opportunity came up for me, it was a no brainer. And it was also the fact that I would be close enough to my friends in London, Mm. um, that I would be able to go and visit them. And that as a writer, there'd always been this sort of like fantasy about Paris. And James Baldwin. <laughs> yeah, exactly. There were so many, even black writers or writers from different places that moved, that went to Paris or had a Paris experience and were inspired by the city. So for me, it was almost like, this is a rite of, of passage and this is going to be where my creativity really blooms as well. So yeah, that's why for all of those reasons, even before I applied for the job, I'd already said in my mind, yeah, Paris, it's going to be Paris and it worked out. Um, But then, yeah. (laughs) I love that. Like, I like how like clear you were about the things and so intentional, which is something that in my journey, that's why I even call my episode on the podcast, the first episode, the unintentional immigrant. (laughs) not want to come like i am here against my will (laughs) but you chose this you were so intentional you were so thorough just listing all of those things and that's something that i i absolutely absolutely thoroughly loved hearing so thank you for sharing that thank you and Um, now that you you had the reasons what has the experience been like um so First off, when I first got the job, the first year, um, I was still working from home in London. So I knew I was going to move to Paris, but I I didn't have to immediately. And so I was still kind of setting myself, setting, setting it up in my mind and coming to terms with the expectations and with what it would feel like leaving, leaving my friends, leaving my home. But I always had this um, high expectation of what Paris would be. You know, the romanticism, everything that we see, all the imagery, etc. And moving to Paris, there are a lot of real things that I had to contend with. First of all, I moved without knowing anyone. There were a couple of people that I was familiar with from work, but outside of that, I didn't actually know anyone. Um, so first of all, the reality of, of making all new friends as an adult, like in my 30s, when I already have you know, my own group groups of friends um, from different time points in my life. But London definitely felt like a more open and accepting culture than Paris. In Paris, I feel like I've seen a lot of Black people in sort of lower paid jobs. And it's it also seems to be a bit different for people to to even see me in certain spaces. I've had situations where I feel like people are looking at me if I'm in, if I'm in a certain space, um, like I'm the token Black person, or um, even where I live, um, 
I sometimes wonder if people actually think I live here or not. <laughs> so I feel like those are quite new um, feelings that I'm having compared to living in London for all those years. And so I, it, it almost feels like there's um, a level of the Paris dream that I'm not sure is necessarily meant for me as a Black person. Um, That's so so, interesting. Yeah. And especially like you as a Black person living there, I mean, like certain parts of the dream maybe are created to be out of reach for Black people to live in, but they can come in and visit and take the Instagram pictures, and then they must abruptly exit. <laughs> and I think that's such an interesting point because I actually spoke to someone about this and he said, oh, I love Paris. Par Paris is such a great place to visit, but I would never live here. And quite a few other people have said similar things. And now I understand why that is because I feel like when you have something in small doses and you can still have quite a controlled experience of it. You, you can still see it in the, in the ways that you imagine it to be. So if someone is in Paris for a couple of days, they can go to the Seine, they can stroll along the river, they can see the Eiffel Tower sparkling. Yes. And they it does sparkle. Go, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> they can go have lunch, um, you know, somewhere really nice and have like a really nice hot chocolate and Get have some croissant. croissant. <laughs> exactly. So they can do all of those things. But then when you're a black person who's living in Paris, you have to deal with things like questions like, okay, where do I, where do I live? How do I find accommodation? Where do I do my hair? Um, where, where do I, how do people see me when I'm going into the store? someone's giving me attitude. Why are they giving me attitude? I'm in a specific restaurant. Why is this person looking at me strangely? So I feel like I'm, those are all the types of things that I'm, I've am i dealt with, which I probably, maybe I wouldn't have dealt with in the same way if I was just visiting here. Um, and I know that when my mom lived in Paris, she had her own experiences. But the funny thing is that when my mom tells the story of Paris, she has created part of the that image, that romanticism I have um, of Paris because for her, it's still somewhere that she comes to. It's still somewhere that she sees to be beautiful. Mm. But I think that's because when it comes to being treated as a Black person, um, she probably experienced that wherever she was regardless. And... Paris so for her, it still... doesn't feel like it was unique to Paris. It's like, as exactly. a black person anyway, this is the treatment that I get. Whereas because you exactly. then had a different experience in the UK, it doesn't feel that, yeah. that and same I think, way. Mm, that's a good yeah, observation. Especially, especially because when she was here or studying here, it was the 70s, 80s. So at that time, because she then, she studied in America um, she used to visit um, London. So I think she experienced racial issues in different places, but Paris still had, Paris still had the romanticism, Paris, Paris still had French, Paris still had fashion, Paris still had the Seine and the Eiffel Tower and croissants and stuff. So I think part of the romanticism I have or the image I have of Paris doesn't only come from movies and tv shows and emily and that Paris. one show that yeah <laughs> the one that has you know completely take taken paris pr to a different level um but it also comes from it also comes from my mom so i think yeah that has that's been interesting trying to marry her experience of paris against mine mm. so. i think one thing i will also say and you also hinted to it in your newsletter. Guys, Eha has an incredible newsletter. She'll tell you about it at the end. So make sure that you um, subscribe to it. But one of the things you spoke about, and even when I was in Paris, is something that I, I was talking to one of my friends, and um, it, you said there's a big West African population in Paris. And I was asking him about, you know, like the Black experience in Paris. And he's like, French people, French people, 
and want to look at everyone as French, that race is not an issue. We are all French, regardless of whether you're white, black, from Morocco, from Togo, from Cameroon. All of those elements are inconsequential. We are all French. We're united by language, we're united by culture. But that doesn't then, you know, see people fully. And what you said is really interesting because I remember reading that there is no census information collected about race in France. And I think maybe that's for that reason. But the problem with that is that when there are issues, like people, the issues that people can visually notice, for example, certain people being in lower paid jobs, without that collecting that kind of information, there's nothing, there's no incentive to do anything about it. Mm. So I don't know. I think it, it's definitely interesting. It's, it's a bit um, complex because I don't necessarily think that everyone is seen the same. Maybe that's the ideal and maybe that's the hope. Um, but I don't think yeah. that's the Not case. quite there yet. <laughs> I think, okay, yeah. so you said all the not so great things about Paris. Now let's talk about the great things about Paris. Where, what are the things that from your mom's experience, your experience, what are the, the things that you guys do see and experience the same way, like where your romanticism meets? <laughs> yeah. No, I think there's some days when I'm just taking a walk and I walk all the way from where I live, which is Montmartre, down to the river. And I see the the boats on the, the river. I see the Eiffel Tower. I go to a cafe with a book. And I just remember on those days, wow, I really live in Paris. So there are some days that Paris really feels like everything I wanted it to feel like. There's so many galleries here. There's so much art. There's so many bookshops. This it's so interesting because in a lot of other places, it almost feels like the physical form of books is, is a dying thing. But here in Paris, there, ev there are bookshops everywhere. Um, and quite, I see quite a few people, you know, reading on the Metro. Um, and for me, this is great because I'm, I'm a writer and I love, I love seeing that. Um, it's, it's inspiring. And also their, their flowers, everywhere there are flower shops everywhere i love it i noticed your bouquet earlier and it's only since i moved to paris that i started buying flowers for myself whenever i go into the flower shop they ask me is it to offer or is it for yourself and i'm always like it's it's for myself <laughs> and it's completely normal and i love it and then there are also boulangeries everywhere there's so boulangerie? much that's where you know croissants are sold and oh, that's bakery <laughs> Yes, exactly. Guys, forgive um, me. I don't know French. <laughs> but they're, they're, they're everywhere, which is a problem for me because I have a sweet tooth. So I feel like, I think my favorite things about living in Paris are they really value pleasure and they really value the pleasure on the senses, whether it's, you know, visually with the flowers or with what they eat with the food and the restaurants everywhere with what they read with with art with galleries with museums there's just and it's Paris is actually maybe a fifth of the size of London so it's quite small but it's so dense with all of these things so I just feel like there's just always something to do there's always so much to do and I don't feel like I could ever run out of things to do in Paris. Sure. So in terms of the literary inspiration that I wanted, I definitely feel like I'm getting that there. And also I think another thing which I love about Paris or what it has allowed me is how I've grown as a person by being here because I came here as an adult without any friends. And when your I lived brother, in London, your brothers and your parents didn't drop you off this time. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And like when I lived in London, I had, I was in a specific routine. I would do the same things every weekend. I would be with the same people, but then coming to Paris, it was taking such a big risk and it was opening myself up in this new way to this new world. And as someone who was always quite introverted, quite quiet, it, it even felt 
like I was coming out of my comfort zone in such a big way. And I feel like I've grown as a result because I, I found myself doing all sorts of things I would have never expected, like talking to people on the street. I've even, I even spoke to people at, at the beginning when I was doing a bit much, I actually spoke to people who were sitting next to me, like at restaurants. I've had all sorts of experiences where I've just been open to, to meeting people and making friends. There've been a couple of people that I was familiar with. I, that I maybe I followed on Instagram, but I'd never met. And then I saw them out in places and actually went up and spoke to them. So I feel like all of those things about my personality um, have been really interesting for me to to learn about here in Paris. And even also being in in this apartment, which was completely unfurnished, and I had to furnish for myself, you know, in a new um, language, in a completely new environment. That was something I never thought I would be doing. Um, so I feel like I've definitely, moving to Paris has, has taught me a lot about myself and has made me um, sort of like rate myself <laughs> in a oh, different way. <laughs> exactly. Either whether, whether it comes down to um, how I am as a person that people are interacting with or what I'm capable of in terms of things I can do, whether it's furnishing a flat or creatively. Um, so yeah, that's been, I think that's the, the best part, the best experience I've had in Paris is the experience of myself. <laughs> yes. The experience of you that Paris has exactly. allowed you to, to explore that Paris is like experiencing yourself in, in the backdrop of Paris. So that's awesome. I really like yeah. that. And I want to go back to something that we spoke about a little bit earlier around your values and being a good girl and how that impacted your dating life. Now you're living yeah. in the city of love, <laughs> the city of romance. To the extent you're comfortable, what is the dating scene like in Paris? <laughs> I'm not going to lie. I'm struggling. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> because... That's the thing, like Paris has a reputation of being city of love. So I really thought it was going to be bringing it, but it's not, it's just not. <laughs> so <laughs> there's this thing that um, French guys say, which is the feeling. And it's about, you know, they want, it's about having the feeling and the feeling really at the end of the day f is more about infatuation um, it's about being in the moment. It's not serious. It's not long term. And at this time in my life, what I'm looking for is something meaningful long term. So for me, even when I am looking on dating apps, I first have to get through the very high percentage of people who are really just there for vibes. <laughs> I'm like, I just have to keep going, keep scanning. And then I make it to maybe, I don't know, one to 5% of normal people. And then even then there's a process of trying to understand whether we're on the same page. So, so far, which is very disappointing. I've only gone on a couple of dates in, in Paris. So it's really not what I was expecting, but 2024, we move. <laughs> we move, girl, in 2024. And I want to let you know that even if you were in D.C., I don't think the dating experience would be that much different. <laughs> I'm so sad to hear this. <laughs> so, you know, I don't want, but D.C. was I not going to deliver anything better. <laughs> yeah. I, I started changing my location to London, so we'll see. Do you know, maybe, that, maybe that's a, just a, a change in location. But just a few more questions in this section, because you did talk about, you know, making friendships in your adulthood. What has that yeah. experience been like, you know, building up that community in Paris? And how do you think your community in Paris looks in contrast to your community in London? In contrast, if you still do, apart from family, what your community in Lagos looks like? So I would say that most of my friendships are, or my close friendships are in, in London. So not just from people I, I met in boarding school, but also even my friends from secondary school in Lagos. Um, most of it is in London. Um, there's a small percentage in Lagos, but I think because of the cultural, like 
the shift now where a lot of people are sort of leaving home and um, going to other places. Quite a lot of people I know have ended up in London. So that's basically where most of my friendships are really. And in Paris, I wouldn't say I have a community yet, but I have individual people um, that I am I'm friends with. So I would say that I now have some people I consider to be friends, and then I have um, acquaintances, which I think is is a good place to be, but it's nowhere near um, what I have in London. And I see that when I'm celebrating things, for example, my birthday, uh, there. I think when I get to the point when I don't feel like I have to run to London to celebrate my birthday with my friends. <laughs> I mean, because I like, for example, this past year I did something in Paris, but so that was that was an improvement from the year before where I was only in London. So, I mean, I feel like that's where my home is or where it feels like my home is in my heart in terms of my friendships. And Paris is building, um, but it's it's not even, it's not comparable at all. But I've definitely met some quality people here who like I'm... I'm building friendships with, and I'm really grateful for that because I think another thing um, which I found interesting is when I was living in London, for example, I was closed off to making new friends because I was okay. I didn't need new friends. And I understand now what it's like to be on the other side, to be the person who is knocking at the door and other people, obviously they're okay. Like there are other people who've even though they might be Nigerian or they might be international, they've lived here for a while. They have their groups of friends that they've made and they're fine. And so for me, I'm now kind of like on the other side of that and understanding that um, that's fine as well. But then there've been some people I've met who've been very open and, you know, very welcoming to, to building new friendships and with whom it's kind of just organically comfortably worked. Um, so yeah, that's been, that's been really good for me as well. Do you think um, language I, has anything to do with some of that? How good is your French? Yeah, I would say, so my French is good, but it's, I'm not fluent or anything. And what I've noticed is that a lot of the people I'm interacting with here are international. They're expats or they're international students or so, which is really interesting. I don't actually have any French friends that's and so I heard, oh my gosh okay we'll continue <laughs> then we'll get into this and yeah. Then, yeah, yeah but i heard that this is quite common because what i heard is um a lot of french people because they've known they've kind of grown up together um so they already have their comfort zones and so they're not really um open in the way that i was describing to making new friends and so the people who I end up sort of coming across a lot are international people. And even let's say when I go to church and my church is more international, the people who um, maybe even people I can relate to are international people as well. So, yeah. It's been the same thing, even with people uh, that live here in the U S where it's similarly saying that they are not connecting struggle to connect with Americans, you know, born and bred in America. Um, So that's been interesting to see that, like, where is the that disconnect, you know? And I don't know if you had an image of what, like, French people are like. I mean, you know, growing up, like, back home, we see Americans all the time on TV and media. So you kind of hear with, like, an idea of what Americans are like this. Whether it's right or wrong, you have some picture. Did you have a picture of what French people were like? from media, what was that that image like to you? I mean, apart from a girl in a beret, like what else did you have in your mind? Girl, I had, you know, except for girl in the beret, I had girl wearing, girls wearing heels, you know, looking impossibly fashionable and put together, um, even on a scooter. You had um, guys smoking cigarettes, being really, just like really cool and aloof. Um, sorry being really cool and aloof. And I feel like um, that is, that image is is still a bit accurate, but not, you know, not fully so. Um, 
I, there, there are definitely some French people I've interacted with um, at work. Um, but yeah, in terms of the people who I end up being friends with, I think it's, it is the degree, maybe it's, it's not only the degree of openness, but it's also the, um, ability to relate to maybe being in this new environment, um, and coming from a different cultural background. Um, and that already is, is common ground that I have with some of, of, of the international people. Mm. So. That's interesting. Maybe next yeah. season in the a podcast, I must talk to people that are born and bred in those cities and ask them, hey, y'all, why don't you want to be friends with us? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyway, uh, that's for that's a whole other season on its own. But for today, thank you so much. Now we're going to um, move over into the rapid fire questions. So okay. this is, you know, fun, easy. Just say the first thing that really comes to mind. Um, yeah, and let's 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 get going. Uh, home or here? Home. Where's home for you? What do you? I know you already kind of mentioned it previously, but um, do you want to reiterate that again? What? Where's home for you? Where do you define as home? Home, L- Lagos family, London, London friends, and me. Mm, okay, multi home girlies. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, what's your favorite food at home? This is not going to sound very Nigerian, but I love basmati rice, <laughs> basmati rice. <laughs> and chicken stew and plantain dodo. Okay, to make it sound more Nigerian, I'll call it dodo, no fried plantain. And Fanta, the Nigerian Fanta, which is heavily sugared. I love that. Goes so, yeah. like an African Fanta in this world. Ooh, um, basmati rice. <laughs> I feel like I some Nigerian people listening. I support you. if you want to cancel her. She can go to another another culture. <laughs> it's okay. I understand. No, no. <laughs> I understand. I understand. Like basmati rice for Nigerian people. Like I mean, oh, there's a can I, can I just say? Can I just say people use bas? We use basmati rice to make jollof rice. Really? Mm. Basmati rice is white rice. It is, but people, from my knowledge, I know people, and I have attended jollof competitions here in Washington, D.C., and Nigeria did not win, just letting you know. <laughs> um, but people use parboiled rice. That's the rice I have been oh, fair shown enough. as the but legit the, rice for jollof rice. Look, by the time you mix the basmati rice with Nigerian chicken stew, yeah, then... That's a Nigerian dish. It's almost the king jollof. <laughs> almost. It's almost. But I mean, I'll let the people decide. Y'all, y'all can decide if you want to give her up to another country. <laughs> What's your favorite snack in Paris? Pan au chocolat. Like the, yeah, with the chocolate swirls in the croissant. Mm, very good. Love very, it. Very, very good. <laughs> Um, if I have never listened to music from Nigeria, what mu- what song and musician would you recommend? And why do you think that song like represents Nigeria? Oh, the pressure. But I have to say Asha. Asha is my girl. I even run into her in Paris. So, but um, Asha all the way because she's been consistent. She's been there since I was like 17. And um, I think maybe if I say a song like Bibanke, which is in Yoruba, it kind of gives more of that Nigerian flavor. Um, she has a lot of deep messages in her songs, um, but I think that one is is particularly beautiful and soothing. So I think that would be a really good introduction to Nigerian music. Plus she inspires a lot of people. So mm, I do. entry I like point that. right there. That is, that yeah. she's a, a really, really great. I think she's a wonderful musician. Like, I even liked her last album. All the stuff that she's put out has been great. No complaints. I agree. Yeah. Um, what's your favorite memory from back home? A memory that like endures and you keep going back to over and over again. How easy it felt when it felt like I was always doing well. I always knew what was next, what was required. Even when I thought that things were hard or I thought that exams were going to be hard, but everything kind of worked out. Um, so I miss that feeling of being at school with my friends, 
um, going home with my brother in the car, um, just having that expectation of that, that, that constant, that the consistency of the expectation of like knowing what tomorrow was going to be like. And yeah, I, so that's what, that's what I miss is just being in that, in a, in a sort of like consistent cycle of ease yeah. with friends and family. Yeah. And when you were there, you were like, I can't wait to grow up. Oh, and now. Exactly. <laughs> That's always the way. <laughs> what is a very Parisian thing or very French thing? Let's take it out of Paris. What is a very French thing that you've experienced where you're like, there's nowhere else in the world, but in France where they do this thing? I didn't realize until when I needed to get like a Metro pass and then they asked me to bring my, my rental agreement to the Metro station. <laughs> so I feel like in terms of the level of bureaucracy, then that's super bureaucratic. I, when you <laughs> so. talk about the Metro, I did, when I was there, like I got a, like a, a Metro ticket and then my friend's boyfriend who was showing me around, he was like, you must take a picture and like put it on your metro card. I'm like, bro, this is a metro card. Do I have to take a passport picture to put on my metro card? It's like, oh, because sometimes the police, like they check people to see if I'm just like, what? Yeah. It's like literally the the police, they will be hiding behind a corner <laughs> at some stations, just waiting <laughs> to see who's going to, and then some people will see them and then they'll, they'll start running in the other direction. So, yeah. Oh, yeah, I think I, I, I kind of see that. And like, I just know that it gets to the point of like, bring your rental agreement. <laughs> <laughs> um, what is something new that you learned about yourself in Paris? Something brand new that you didn't know about yourself coming even from London? I said in theory, but it's actually, I actually, this is the, f I think Paris has actually tested my, my limits as, as a person because I've had to do things or be in situations like even when it comes to loneliness, like not having friends here or um, sorting out all these different administrative things or creatively. Um, so I feel like Paris has generally sort of flirted with a lot of my limits and um, therefore it's like, I, I can actually now see what I'm capable of, not just in theory, um, but like actually in practice. So that's a good thing to discover for sure. <laughs> What's something about yourself from back home that you're holding on to here? Apart from being a good girl <laughs> or well, alongside being a good girl. <laughs> um, even though I don't necessarily think I'm like the most street smart person in the world, compared to other people, like compared to my brothers, I feel like I do have a little bit of common sense and I do have a, you know, light bit of paranoia. So I feel like even when I navigate environments, whether it's in London or Paris or when I'm traveling, I, I'm always kind of wary and, and paying attention and quite skeptical. Um, so I think that that has kind of like served me well because then at least I'll just be positively surprised if anything, as opposed to the other way around. So, yeah. I agree. I totally agree. You have to have your wits about you in a place like Lagos. <laughs> um, <clears throat> what form of non-financial support do you wish you had when you first arrived in Paris? I think just warmth, like warm welcome um, like just people being like, you know, super welcoming and, um, offering to, to help, um, or to, um, to visit that kind of thing. But then I would say that I feel like I had that to some extent with some of the people that I, I met. Um, but yeah, if there was a way that there was some kind of welcoming committee, <laughs> I'll just be like that when I, when I arrived at you know, from the Eurostar and then, you know, it's just like really warm and tell, I don't know, some kind of community. I think yeah. that would have been, that would have been really nice. And to be honest, there are 
I found that there's some things now. There are like a couple of WhatsApp communities that I'm part of, like for experts of color or um, a Nigerian one for for people here. Um, but yeah, they they're kind of more, um, I guess, for information. Um, so yeah, I think that would have, in terms of non financial support, I think just that the warmth um, that would have been nice. Mm. And um, what if, if someone is thinking of moving, apart from you being part of the welcoming committee for them, if someone was thinking of moving to Paris, what advice do you have for them? Someone similar to you, an adult, someone who has a life, a well-lived life, and they're thinking of making the move to Paris, what are some things they should consider? I think they should really, first of all, they should think about what they're trying to get from here or like why they're moving. Um, and then secondly, they should, um, have a realistic view of what Paris is. So, I mean, obviously by having a conversation with someone like me, I will tell you the truth (laughs) that it's not just the romantic image. Um, so once they're aware of that, and then they're also aware of what they stand to gain, um, and then they also need to kind of know about like, you know, where do they want to live? Um, all of those practical things, because I feel like those are also things that are quite stressful um, in Paris to deal with. Um, and yeah, what where will they find their community or where will they look for that? So I feel like, I, yeah, the key things I would say are um, setting realistic expectations and doing your research and knowing what you're like being clear on what you're trying to find in that city or in that space yeah very very important things to know talking about cities and spaces has here become home i wrote something which i think but if if i could just kind of summarize um so home basically belies the proximity and I am here and therefore because I'm here then this is home but this is not ultimately like where I think of home but this is where my body is and my body is home so for the moment here is home <laughs> I love that oh my gosh okay like we need that you you you, can, you have to find it and let me put it on our Instagram. Like, well, you can't just leave us hanging. Like, we need it word for word. So, I, I think uh, so. I can have it for myself at the very least. Like, I keep telling people, and they're laughing when I tell them. I'm like, for me, doing this podcast is therapy. I know Oprah said she's never been to therapy because, you know, and doing talking to people has been her therapy in the same way. Having these conversations and finding out how people decided on where to be is therapeutic for me. So hearing a statement like that, it it shifted something in me. So I I need that as part of my healing journey. So thank you. It's part of my decision making process. So as I'm sitting here talking to you, like it's, 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 it's curiosity. Like I love your story. I want to hear everybody's story. I think stories are so powerful and they, they teach a lot. Uh, but it's also a, a, a piece of data that is helping me make my own decision. So I really, really am so yeah. grateful to you for coming on and having this wonderful conversation that has taken us, you know, our first European, uh, the first, you're our Eurostar. You are our Eurostar. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> Literally. So thank you so much. Um, if people want to get in touch with you, if they want to subscribe to all, to read all this incredible writing that's going down in Paris. Uh, and I know you're like, you're like playing around with like new formats in your storytelling too. Where can they get in touch with you? Thank you so much. And thanks for having me. It's been such a pleasure talking to you. Um, but yeah, I'm on Substack. Um, so my Substack is E-H-A-E-L-O-N-G-E dot Substack dot com. Um, or you can search Ink Tipped Dreams, which is basically the name of my page on Substack or Instagram. So yeah, you can find me there and you can find my my writing there and my thoughts on Paris life and my travels, home, etc. Well, thank you so much, Ehi. Do you want to say goodbye to us in French <laughs> and wish us well? Au revoir. <laughs> 
à bientôt. <laughs> Bonne chance. <laughs> Thank you so much, guys. As always, thank you for listening to today's episode. If you enjoyed the show and you want to stay connected, make sure that you are subscribed and following us on your favorite podcasting platform, which does include YouTube. Your support means the world to me, and it helps me to keep bringing you this type of content. Also, don't forget to rate the podcast, give us a good rating, and to leave a review, leave a comment, because your feedback also helps to shape the show, and it lets me know what type of stuff you guys want to keep hearing and seeing. Lastly, if you have any questions, feedback, suggestions, DM me on our Instagram account, which is home to hear. We can't wait to hear from you. Bye, guys. Bye.